سب کی تشریف لانے کا شکریہ ادا کرنا چاہتا ہوں ویس رہو رہو صاحب چیئرمین آف دا بورڈ آف گورنرز آف دا یونیورسٹی آف لاہور آسم صاحب جن کا تعلق لاہور میوزیم سے ہے سفیان بجار صاحب اور ڈاکٹر اورنگ زیب حنیف صاحب سب کا میں بہت ممنون ہوں ڈاکٹر اورنگ زیب صاحب کی تعارف کا میں مستحق نہیں ہوں بہت بہت شکریہ جو آپ نے تفصیلی تعارف کرایا میں بے شک بالکل مستحق نہیں ہوں اور ڈاکٹر نعمان الحق صاحب ڈاکٹر فیصل باری صاحب اور ڈاکٹر قاسمی صاحب سب یہاں موجود ہیں آپ کے تشریف لانے کا بہت شکریہ یہ میرے لیے بہت اعزاز کی بات ہے موضوع کے مناسبت سے تو یہ خطاب مقابی زمان میں ہونا چاہیے اور میری بہت خواہش بھی تھی کہ یوں ہی ہو مگر اس خواہش کو پورا کرنے میں تین مشکلات درپیش آئیں پہلی تو مقتض بیان نہیں ہے اور وہ صرف وقت کی بے حد تنگی تھی یہ اس خطاب کرنے کی دعوت مجھے کچھ پانچ چھ دن یا ایک ہفتے پہلے شاید ملی تو مجھے موقع نہیں ملا کہ میں اپنے خیالات کا اظہار اردو میں کر سکوں لیکن دوسری اور تیسری مشاکل متلازم ہیں اور ان کی تفصیل سے شاید میرے خطاب کا کے مدعے کا ثبوت بھی معلوم ہوتا ہے اس کا میں کچھ عرض کرنا چاہوں گا اس کے بارے میں دوسری دوسری مشکل یہ ہے کہ حقیقت کہ یہ حقیقت اب ہم سب پہ بہت واضح ہے کہ اس دور میں ہماری زبانیں اپنے ہی معانی اور مفاہیم کے میراث سے محروم ہو چکی ہیں چونکہ معنی کے آباد جہاں اجاڑ دیے گئے ہیں تو ایک مستقل اور مستمر نظریاتی گفتگو کے گفتگو کے وسائل بھی محدود ہیں اور اگر یہ وسائل صرف مضمر اور محمل صرف مضمر اور محمل ہیں مفقود نہیں تو پھر تیسری مشکل کا بیان میں یوں پیش کروں گا معاشرے اور تقالید اساساً معانی کے درمیان جو نسبت ہے اس کا ظہور ہوتے ہیں اور معانی ہمیشہ الفاظ میں پوشیدہ ہوتے ہیں ہر لفظ ایک یا زائد معنی پہ دلالت کرتا ہے اور ہر معنی اور معنی سے اپنے قوت تفہیم حاصل کرتا ہے یعنی ہر معنی ایک لحاظ سے مرکب ہوتا ہے گویا کہ آپ کو مفرد لگے شاید اس نقطے کو پر اثر کرنے میں میں ایک قیاس مفید سمجھوں تصور کیجئے کہ ایک معنی ایک درخت کی جڑ ہے ایک ہی درخت کی جڑیں ایک مستر سے پھوٹتی ہیں اور پھر ان کا انتشار ہوتا ہے بسا اوقات خاکی خاکی تنے دو یا زائد درختوں کی جڑیں ایک دوسرے سے الجھ جاتی ہیں اور الجھ کر توانائی توانائی حاصل کرتی ہیں اور یوں ہی جڑوں کا ایک پیچیدہ شبہ کا وجود میں وجود میں آتا ہے ہمارے پاؤں تلے اور ہمارے پاؤں تلے چھپا اور پھر انہی جڑوں سے زمین کی سطح سے ایک نیا درخت اور نیا پودا نمودار ہوتا ہے آپ یہ آپ پہ یہ ضرور آپ پر یہ ضرور واضح ہو چکا ہوگا کہ اس قصے میں میرا اشارہ تہیں زمین بنے ہوئے معانی کے شبے کے اور زمین کے اوپر ان سے جڑے اور میسر الفاظ کی طرف ہے دوران کلام الفاظ کا پیرونا معنی کی تشکیل تو ہے لیکن موجودہ معانی جو تہ زمین ہوتے ہیں موجودہ زمانی اس عمل معانی اس عمل کے مقدر بھی ہیں اس لحاظ سے ہر قوم کا طرز بیان ادب کے میزان میں تولا جاتا ہے اور اس کا تقدم اور خود تنقیدی صرف اس میدان گفتار میں مفید نہیں ہوتی ہیں جو طبی ہو تو تیسری مشکل یہ ہے کہ میں اس کلام کو اردو میں کیسے نقل کروں جس کا طبی ماحول کسی اور تقلید سے تعلق رکھتا ہے کیا اس کلام کے الفاظ ہمارے شبہ کے معانی کے آب رفت میں جڑ پکڑ سکتے ہیں یا کہ وہ ہر نوع اجنبی کی طرح ہمارے مقامی چمن کو اجاڑ دیں گے کیا وہ مسائل جو اس کلام میں متضمن ہیں صرف اس خاص کلام کی پیچیدگی کا نتیجہ ہیں یا کہ وہ عمومی ہیں کیا ہمارے میدان گفتار کے ذریعے ایک بالکل جدید جہاں تراشی ہو سکتی ہے کیا وہ ہونی چاہیے 
میری نظر میں ترجمے کا عمل اس کے عمل میں ایک استعماری اور استحکامی مقصد ضرور شامل ہوتا ہے تو ان وجوہات کی بنا پر میں اب میں خطاب انگریزی میں شروع کرتا ہوں لیکن مجھے یقین ہے کہ موضوع کے لحاظ سے آپ اس اختیار کی ستم ظریفی کو سمجھتے ہوں گے اور زبان غیر سے کیا شرح آرزو کرتے عبد الفتح کلی تو آئی تھنکر آئی ڈیپلی ایڈمائر ریمائنڈز اس دیٹ وی آر گیسٹس آف لینگویج اینڈ سو وی ٹیک فرام اٹس باؤنٹی ٹو شیپ آر ورلڈ اینڈ ٹریٹ اٹ ود دا رسپیکٹ دیٹ اے جنرس ہاؤس ڈیزرس ایز سینسیٹیو اینڈ گریٹ فل گیسٹس آف لینگویج وی ڈو ناٹ ڈسٹرب اور ماڈیفائی وٹ دا ہوسٹ آفرس بٹ دین کلی تو آلسو کوکلی ریمائنڈز اس آف دا پیراڈاکس آف دس ریلیشن شپ For sometimes, we are the hosts and language inhabits us as the most impertinent of guests, taking possession of all who we are, all of our wares, making us and our worlds for us. These two aspects of language, in my view, stand in for a related set of irreducible and inextricable dichotomies between dynamism and tradition, agency and passivity, writing and reading. Language is symbol. Symbols bring us the world. They bring the world to us. Just as much as we craft them, namely symbols, to frame the world we experience. The first encounter with language and symbol is through some mode of reading. The second, some mode of writing. One cannot be without the other. Lately, we post-colonials have been misinformed about the practice of reading, and we have believed what we have been told. In colonial societies, and with greater intensity now that we are presumably free and post-colonial, we have been trained to read in order to extract information and perhaps to instrumentalize such information to practical effect. But reading, in its proper sense, is both an embodied and agentive experience. To read properly is to become the author of the piece one is reading, to inhabit the choices the author makes, to choose with the author the cultural and literary allusions, to be immersed in the historical and personal circumstances of the author, the circumstances of immediate effect and temporal extension. In other words, to read is to read with and through the various secretions upon which the traces of each of the author's lines are sketched. Reading, therefore, is in its proper sense, whether it is reading music or an omen or a facial expression or a text, reading in its proper sense is an aesthetic experience. And I use this term aesthetic, which has been naturalized in the English language, of course, with a view to its Greek root, aesthestai, to perceive, to sense, to feel. And this is, in fact, the meaning of reading as a kind of embodiment and becoming, not mere passive receptivity, the, an embodiment and becoming that is captured in various languages, including and especially in Islamic ones. The words lesen, for example, in German, legere in Latin, both mean to read in an ordinary sense. Of course, you can say, ich lese das Buch, You can say Lego Librum, that simply means I am reading the book. But at their core and in primary attestations, they refer to the activity of collecting. The word lectio, for example, lexicography, they all come from the same root, collecting and so on. When you select and when you intellect and when you elect all the words derived from the base lesen and legere, you're engaged in the activity of culling and shaping something out of a group of choices. You're engaged in an environment and an ecosystem out of which you're creating new worlds in the act of what we call reading. This sense of agency and indeed embodiment is found in much sharper terms in the Islamic languages. Qara'a, for example, Qira'a, Qur'an, are recitations. Speech acts. It's not passive reading. They're speech acts. You recite things. Speech acts that both shape soundscapes and in choices of variant readings, for example, they give meaning to a written text in the act of reading. The written text is thus rewritten in the act of reading. 
Simil similarly, in Urdu, for example, Parthana is not just to read in the ordinary sense, but also to study and therefore to absorb and embody a text. Khandan in Farsi has the same range. I expect that my point about reading as an active and inhabited, even a somatic exercise should be clear by now. Reading and engagement with language begins with aesthetic receptivity, and again, it is aesthetic in the fundamental meaning of the word, namely involving what we sense and feel through ourselves. And insofar as it is an aesthetic experience, it is simultaneously agentive and productive, just as the input to our senses elicits a response from us. But if reading is an embodied experience, and a complex experience that extends well beyond the page, then the question of its proper locus, meaning how and where is reading optimal, that question becomes important. For we know that the same sensory input confronts us with distinct intensities in different places and times. Readings must have optimal environments, alluvia that nourish them, spaces to which they're indigenous. In the broadest terms, this would include specific etiquettes of engagement, modes of transmission, referential canons, awareness of history, of the contemporary moment, of the author and her world, and of one's own position and positionality. In its proper environment, uh, in its proper en environment, active reading, which is an aesthetic exercise, is in fact a writerly exercise. It cultivates new worlds, but in a specific and complex ecosystem. As a paradox, that same ecosystem is a condition both for proper readings and new readings. Reading must be autochthonous and authentic, deeply rooted in its soil, sensed and felt through the body, and simultaneously utterly resistant and irreverent to, to the work that each new generation puts out, as each new generation grafts new readings upon the fertile soil out of which it springs. New shoots do not spring in dead soil. New shoots never spring in dead soil, just as those with no sensory stimulus, those who have been anesthetized, can move neither themselves nor the world around them. So as I was saying, reading is always the reading of symbols, and all symbols are language, at least for our purposes as humans. Language, in turn, thrives in its native discursive space, and that space is both diachronous with the weight of tradition, something readerly, and synchronous as it becomes writerly in its future gestures. Philology, the study of how language shapes and is shaped in its environment, namely in its native discursive field, philology is the tool with which no agentive reader or writer can dispense. Now to return to my metaphor, philology turns the alluvia, it turns the fertile soil upon which new germ may be sown and from which new harvests may be gathered. It exposes the discursive accretions upon which readings are based. It allows us both to read authentically and to nurture new readings as offshoots of the old, what I call new writing out of old reading. To remove language and philology from a people and therefore to extinguish reading in the manner I have been describing is to deny them the possibility of agency, of dynamism, and of a future. It is to turn reading into mere passive re receptivity. So where is this kind of reading capacity to be cultivated? Where do we find it and where do we develop it? Historically, its home in the West, at least, has been the humanities. It is in the division of humanities that one sets up a canon and the intertext settles questions of tradition and critique and shapes the reading practices and by extension the writing of people and writing practices. Reading and writing within the fold of a discursive space allow for making and unmaking new worlds in all their richness. Critique too. Critique is also folded within tradition. And it is for this reason that I think that humanities as an instrument of power and of empowering and disempowering a people is very, very important. It lies at the core of becoming, making worlds, being agents, and it can also disempower you if it is taken away from you. So how did we, the post-colonials, become disempowered? Uh, let me offer a representative quotation from a fateful speech uh, that I'm sure most of you know, but it will be worth revisiting it. A fateful speech of a colonial master 
with which our impoverishment began. In February 1835, the influential member of the British India's Governor General's Council stated the following quotation in response to an 1813 Act, British Act of Parliament. And now we need to go to the slide, which, the next slide, please. Management of the learned natives of India and for the introduction and promotion of a knowledge of the sciences among the inhabitants of the British territories. It is argued, or rather taken for granted, that by literature the parliament can have meant only Arabic and Sanskrit literature, that they never would have given the honorable appellation of a learned native to a native who was familiar with the poetry of Milton, the metaphysics of Locke, and the physics of Newton. But they meant to designate by that name only such persons as might have studied in the sacred books of the Hindus all the uses of Cusa grass and all the mysteries of absorption into the deity. This does not appear to be a very satisfactory interpretation. All parties seem to be agreed on one point, that the dialects commonly spoken among the natives of this part of India contain neither literary nor scientific information and are moreover so poor and rude that until they are enriched from some other quarter, it will not be easy to translate any valuable work into them. It seems to be admitted on all sides that the intellectual improv improvement of those classes of the people who have the means of pursuing higher studies can at present be, present be offered, sorry, be affected only by means of some language not vernacular amongst them. What then shall that language be? One half of the committee maintain that it should be English. The other half strongly recommend the Arabic and Sanskrit. The whole question seems to me to be which language is the best worth knowing? And now he admits, I have no knowledge of either Sanskrit or Arabic, but I have done what I could to form a correct estimate of their value. I have read translations of the most celebrated in, in Sanskrit books. I have conversed both here in home and at home with men distinguished by their proficiency in the Eastern languages. I'm quite ready to take the Orient, Oriental learning at the valuation of the Orientalists themselves. I have never found one among them, among the Orientalists, who could deny that a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. The intrinsic superiority of the Western literature is indeed fully admitted by those members of the committee who support the Oriental plan of education. How then stands the case? And he concludes, we have to educate a people who cannot at present be educated by means of their mother tongue. We must teach them some foreign language. We must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern, a class of persons Indian in blood and color, but English in tastes, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. In South Asia, the fate of local learning, of tradition, language, history, was sealed with these words. What came after, we all know, and we're still suffering from today. The same happened in much of the rest of the global south. What was lost in languages was lost also in the improvish improvishment of concepts and alternative frames of organizing the world and of world making, the point with which I began, including my comments in Urdu. Again, of reading authentically, that's what was lost reading authentically and of writing with power and through tradition. There are other robust integral semantic fields that have been lost with the loss of language. With this loss, the freedoms to choose a human condition on one's own terms have also been curtailed. In my remaining time, I'm going to offer an example of how when alien spaces, uh, when alien species were planted on our alluvium, when alien species were planted on our alluvium, they utterly transformed our discursive field and with it our ability to read and write our pasts and our futures. I'm going to speak in my remaining time about the concept of Watan, what we understand today through the medium of the English language and cognates in European language, languages as nation state. The nation state, as we understand today, is, is a bounded region Pakistan is a nation state. It is a determinate tract of land to which we can lay claims as our right. 
Within this tract of land, we owe obligations, own private property, recognize structures of governance, afford and deny privileges, and be defended by rhetoric and by force of arms, if necessary, against the other, outsiders who pose a threat to its demarcated integrity. In its contemporary incarnation, your watan is your land. Pakistan, Hindustan, America, and so on. Your watan is your land. It is a fundamental right that is preserved and authorized by positive legal traditions, or in some cases, authorized by appeal to natural law. It is within the scope of this bounded space that we demand independence from others, protest when it is wrested away, made subject to our inventors and preservers of its laws, laws which apply to us as citizens and which thereby make citizens humans and non-citizens something less than human. This notion of watan is today uh, to, uh, as basic to us as our right to life, or so we think and so we believe and so we protest and so we fight. I've said it before that if we think, as we will see, watan is a very different thing in the tradition, the discursive space that, that, that is ours. Uh, this is one way, a trick through which Palestine can never be free. The demand for the freedom of Palestine rests on the, the idea of a watan as a nation state. Uh, but we'll talk more about that as we go forward. My thesis in today's lecture is that the meaning of watan as homeland is an inflection away from its original meaning within the broad Islamic semantic field in the service of a colonial enterprise. For pre-modern Arabic, Urdu, and Persian, those texts written in those languages place a different premium on this term. In the Arabic literary traditions of the pre-modern period, watan is associated with longing, not belonging. This longing is not ancillary to the notion of land. Rather, although land is important, it is still, properly speaking, only a vehicle whereby various forms of longing are articulated. To put it differently, watan is a projection of a future state or a construction of a memory in relation to which the present is imagined to actualize. The, the present is a potentiality, always incomplete and unfulfilled. It aims to turn to a home of its perfection. Watan is often tied to shauk, for example, desire, as we will see in the examples that will come. To ghurba, estrangement, and to hanin, longing. This metaphorical home of feeling finds its reification in the notion of a landed or grounded existence. Of course, our experiences are bound by space and time. So if you are going to long, you're going to long in space and time. And therefore, as an ancillary, um, as a contingent aspect of this longing, the nation state begins to emerge in the long trajectory of the development of the meaning of watan in Islamic history. A specific bounded piece of land is hardly the essential feature of watan. It's not an essential feature of it. It's a contingent or accidental feature of it in pre-modern Muslim sources. So various sensibilities are tied to the notion of watan. Let us consider some of these on the basis of some literary testimonies. So you don't think that I am giving you a lecture here on the basis of my, my, own, uh, my own thoughts. I'm referring back to a rich tradition where the expression occurs. So let's begin. We consider some of these together on the basis of some literary testimonies um, att attributed among others, for example, to Ulayya bint al-Mahdi, sister of the famous Caliph Harun al-Rashid. So we'll go to the next slide. And this is what we, this is what we read. A stranger in Marj weeps longing for loved ones who are absent. When a caravan approaches from the direction of his land, he inhales a scent seeking a cure. The land is a source whence the cure comes. That's the point. But the cure is not the land itself. It is the scent of the loved ones that issues from the land that is the cure. In similar fashion, another sentiment is often covered in the sources. So we read, for example, the following. Next one. The, the land that gave you milk and suckled you, I was an embryo in its dunes and a suckling infant in its clouds. Its river valleys nursed me and its water catches suckled me. Its ground gave birth to me and its air nourished me. A man's land is his wet nurse. One more time, a man's land is his wet nurse. Just as a wet nurse has the right of milk over you, so your land, your ard, has the right of homeland 
meaning watan, over you. So reads the Arabic, right? Just as a wet nurse has the right of milk over you, so your ard, your land, has the right of watan, or homeland, over you. In the series of quotations, the two that I've just provided, land is a maternal force and a source of nurture. By virtue of this position, it has gained the rights, the rights of watan over the beneficiary. It's because of that that the rights of watan are being invoked. The analogy is instructive. Just as the nurture that is given by wet nurse affords her the right of milk over the child, so the sustenance, the sustenance afforded by the land guarantees it the rights of watan over a person. Watan, therefore, is bounded by the sentiment of reciprocity and care. The land is the recipient of this wataniya, meaning the sentiment of reciprocal attachment to the land. Watan is not equivalent to a mere locus of habitation. In fact, in the quotation I just offered, it cannot be bounded land anyway. You cannot read watan to mean bounded land. It would make no sense. The testimonies reveal other allied sentiments. We read, for example, from the 9th century poet Al -Rumi, uh, Ibn Rumi, the next quote, and he says, the autan of men are dear to them. The autan of men dear to them because of the goals they achieve there in youth. When they remember the autan, they are reminded of the time of childhood spent there, and for that they yearn. So here again, we return to the refrain of youth, memory, and yearning in connection with the notion of watan. In various ways, the ideas of return and postpone, postponed fulfillment is consistently tied to the watan, which is not what one holds, but what one inclines towards as a construct of faded or unfulfilled memories and promises. The pull of watan is mediated also by unrequited or lost love. We read, for example, the following verses attributed again to the celebrated 9th century polymath, al jahil he writes, I love the land or the ard where Sulaima dwells, even if it is surrounded by barrenness. It is not my fate to love the soil or the turab of a land, of, a, of an ard, but rather the beloved who resides there. In this most apt example, the poet asserts the love of land, of ard, while also rejecting it for, for itself. The land gives no nurture. It is barren and its soil does not yield benefit. Its value lies in its association with Sulaima, the beloved who dwells therein. In other words, it is the land's association with social nurture that makes it watan. In other cases, it is material, political, or even um, the material, political nurture, nurture that mediates the love of land to constitute its wataniya. In such cases, and unlike the longing of the first love and the yearning to return to the maternal source and beginning, cases where watan remains fixed, watan becomes transferable in these other cases I've just mentioned. Put differently, if the nature of the sentiment is such as to be mobile, then your watan follows suit. Your watan also becomes mobile in the sources. It can also be transferred. As a place of initial nurture, watan is immobile. As a place of family, it may be moved. As a place of wealth or piety, it is actually movable. You find this in the sources. I'll show you in just a moment. In this vein, one, one often finds in the literary anthologies the idea of renouncing autan. You renounce your watan, autan that are base, in favor of travel and displacement, ihtirab. This theme then develops into accounts of comparison. Does one accept the ease of estrangement of ghurba in place of the hardship of watan, a land that does not nurture? Is your real watan the land of ghurba? Thus one adopts a new watan, a place of fulfillment associated with a new land. So it's about fulfillment and longing, actualization. And so again in the ninth century, yet again we read Abu Tamam, the following verses. The inclination of the soul towards family and watan should not prevent the life of ease you seek. In every balad, in every country, if you settle there, you will meet family to replace family and neighbors to replace neighbors. The statement of the poet may mislead us if it is taken to suggest that balad is the same as watan. It's clearly not. Rather, the poet is saying that any balad can be your watan, since you can find therein your family and neighbors. Thus, although the associative qualities of watan have not been displaced, paradoxically, watan itself can be found in ghurba, in estrangement. 
And it is in this vein that one then encounters statements in the ninth century from the likes of Ibn al-Mu'addal, and he says, if a watan makes me uneasy, then every balad is my watan. Right, it's worth thinking about. We think about watan as our, as our, as our nation state, and presumably there's only one nation state that you have, but watan does not mean that landed space. It's longing, promise, loss, fulfillment, potentiality. So once again, Ibn al-Mu'addal says, if a watan makes me uneasy, then every balad is my watan. And in the seventh century, we read Malik ibn al-Rayb. Uh, next slide. If the family of Marwan treats us justly, we will come close to you, even if they urge us to stay away, leaving a dar of humiliation on the earth. Every bilad can become a watan like my bilad. Right? So I hope the point is becoming clearer. This is how they talk about watan before the modern age. Such words are common in anthologies that collect verses on the theme of renouncing mawatan. There are whole anthologies about leaving your watan and making a new watan. Large books. Perhaps these points about watan as a notion grounded in projected futures, distant memories, and the complexity of sentiments of erotic and maternal love, of fulfilled youth um, and dispossessed adulthood, of the eroding body of the self like the land of changing landscapes, perhaps the complexity of these sentiments can be sustained further if we turn to the earliest attestations of the term. We're going even before Islam. As I noted, it is rather telling that watan is almost always associated with a longing, a projection back to the past or into the future. You can never have your watan now, if you think about watan in these terms. Thus, a watan is what is potentially, never quite in one's possession. It is, it is a kind of projection. The association of long longing with watan is part of the rather well-known idea that some of you may know, pre-Islamic poetry and onward, is called al-hanin ila al-awtan, often translated as longing for lands or your, your country. It's a theme in poetry and prose that is explored masterfully by various pre-modern Arabo-Islamic literature. In pre-Islamic and early Islamic poetry, this theme is, uh, almost always occurs with two additional elements. A camel that cries and moans. Hanna means to cry. It's a cry of a camel, actually. So it's associated with Hanna, to cry and to moan, due to its loss of a water source. It longs for the surroundings where it had access to this water source. So Hanin, ila al-awtan, or longing for land, is almost always associated with a camel who's lost the water source and who's crying for it. Again, it's, about, it's not about the place. He wants the water. So we read, for example, uh, the following verses, and I think these are anonymous. Ida hanna, ida hanna bi dahna fasilu hawan lahu, ida hanna bi dahna fasilu hawan lahu, min al bi'r al thamiliy ibn ibn al aqsa. Hard to say. Min al bi'r al thamiliy ibn al aqsa. When a young camel moaned in its longing at dahna in its desire for the well of Thamil bin Asqah. Or, the next slide. Ara ibli bi jawfil ma'i hannat. Ara ibli bi jawfil ma'i hannat. Wa aw wa a' wazaha bihil ma'ur rawa'u. I see my camels long, a moan, a moaning and longing in the heart of the water source as the gentle water did not avail itself there. The examples are numerous creating a distinct sense that the longing for the source of basic nourishment, namely water by the camel, is a metaphor for the longing of the sustenance of life by the Bedouin. And that's how the poetry transforms when you get into the, into the early Islamic period. The Hanin al-Awtan, the water source of the camel, becomes the Hanin of the Bedouin for his life that he had left behind and gone in the urban centers. Both move from place to place, attaching themselves to the memory of land, and of ruins of atlal to the extent that they fulfill a desire. In other words, the longing for watan, al-hanin ila al-awtan, is tantamount to the longing for water, al-hanin ila al-ma. Sentiments are potentially innumerable and potentially and actually mobile. They are not bound by a specific land. Thus, the longing shifts in the early Islamic period to a longing for Mecca. So you get hanin lil Mecca, uh, li Mecca. And for the longing of the spiritual purity of Mecca. 
So again, it's not about the land where Mecca is, it's, it's God's home that becomes your watan. Uh, it shifts to, for the sounds and fragrances and the flora and the fauna of the desert for the Bedouin. The sentiments of longing keep shifting and along with them the specificity of the idea of watan. And ultimately, of course, we have ended up here where the watan in modernity has become a very specific thing. What you long for, presumably, or so we think, is this bounded land, whether it's Pakistan or the USA and so on. In its basic meaning, then, watan is only contingently territorial. Of course, it will be territorial because we are human beings bounded by space and time. So it will lead to the idea of territory. It was landed because sentiments are located in space and time. Its stability as this place was grounded in the feeling of being nurtured in a place of origin. Its mobility was justified by the ephemeral sense of need and desire. It is for this reason also that ironically, it is often the exiles and the dispossessed, and I want to make this point again. It's ironically, it is often the exiles and the dispossessed. For example, the brigand poets, Ashwara al Lusus the emigrants from Mecca, the Muhajirun, the women who left their homes in marriage, and the Bedouin who were forced to embrace an accelerating urbanization, these are the people who in poetry talk about Watan. So that's the first thing. Uh, as far as essentializing meaning, I think you might know my answer. I, I, because I think of concepts as constructed out of a discursive space, constantly evolving, as a kind of a cycle being self-referential, right? A certain concept refers back to its tradition. It protests against it within that tradition, knowing that tradition, and it goes in a new direction. I don't think you'll have one fixed meaning of anything. Um, meanings have to change, and what, what would make you, what would make us empowered is to know how we are changing it, in what way those meanings are changed while they're connected with and anchored in, in a discursive field. So if I understood you correctly, I, I, I don't think essentializing any meaning uh, would be useful. I think we're free in being in the varieties of meaning, but being conscious of it. Um, I, I do want to say this last thing, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, um, I think we did, for, at this moment, we have essentialized, for example, the meaning of Watan. And as, as I was saying in the, in the course of my lecture, this is one of the reasons, frankly, why Palestine can never be free. The condition of the freedom of, Pal of Palestine is that it must be a nation state. That nation state is granted to it by certain structures of power. Those structures of power are not in, their, in our control. There are certain structures that veto resolutions. So until you have a, cit a Palestine, you cannot have a citizenry. If you do not have a citizenry, you do not have a law. If you do not have a law, you cannot be human. So, um, so I don't know the solution to any of it, but I know where the problem emerges, I think. It's grounded in our acceptance of an essentializing notion of belonging. Um, and I think that's where we're stuck.